thanks for inviting me. And it's, it's really nice to be back at SLU, although it is only virtually. <laughs> But I have a feeling I'll be uh, I'll be in your neighborhood pretty soon. Actually, I have some specific plans already coming your way. But but wonderful to see many familiar faces, and I'm I'm really and I'm not lying. I'm really thrilled that that urban forests are are picked as this topic to kind of bring together uh, different fields because that has been one of the things in my career I've been working hard to uh, to do as well. So so I'm really happy that the two uh, future platforms have taken this initiative. Well done, and I hope um, this will kick off some really interesting discussions and collaborations. So let me just share my slides. Um, yeah, what are urban forests? That seems to be an easy question, right? But it's actually a pretty uh, contested uh, discussion still because urban forests can be many, many things as I will uh, will talk today in my 20 minutes. Uh, and here you already see some imagery here from Barcelona, from the area where I'm living, um, trees along streets, which uh, according to the North American tradition are very much the urban forest. While of course we in uh, in many European countries come in often more from a like a forest ecosystem, a woodland perspective, and this is not so strange because we have a long history uh, in many European countries. Do uh, you see Nuremberg on the top left and Haarlem in the on the right, uh, where cities and forests have had this kind of interesting relationship? Um, cities needed forest; they needed it for uh, for timber, for construction wood, for uh, for grazing of animals. Um, also as a kind of a backup or a, a reserve in times of crisis. Uh, but of course, on the other end, cities also destroyed forests as they went along uh, in their development. But in many cases, uh, cities across Europe still have these city forests or Stadtwald in German that are closely linked to the city and its development. Uh, just one example of a, of a forest that's actually a little bit further away from the city, the forest of Fontainebleau near Paris, although this is about 60 kilometers south of Paris, uh, has become really what they call a promenade parisienne, the walk, the walking area for the, for the Parisians for many, uh, many years already. Um, so it's so a really inter interesting uh, dynamics and also a work of, uh, or I should say, an inspiration for artists, for culture, uh, and a place of contention, a lot of conflicts over, over this forest. Uh, should we have conservation? Should we have culture? Should we have timber production? And how do you deal with all these different interests in, a, in an iconic place like that? So in a book I wrote a few years ago, this is the second edition which came out uh, in 2018. Uh, I actually wrote about this, uh, these interesting conflicts over urban forests, over city forests. Uh, and, and in the case of Fontainebleau, they talk even about eco-terrorists. So people who were chaining themselves to the trees and trying to prevent uh, the state forest service, the French state forest service uh, from harvesting. And you can actually just go go on Google these days and you'll find that these kind of conflicts are still playing out very much. So, so forests and cities, of course, have had this very complex relationship over time and actually still have today. So urban forestry, though, is more than city forests. So I think this is an important thing to say at the start of this talk, right? So it is really defined as this conglomerate of trees and associated vegetation. So we look at trees, other vegetation that's connected to that from a, from a holistic, a socio-ecologic perspective. Um, so here we really start with, with uh, street trees, garden trees, and then we move all the way to this kind of larger peri-urban forest areas that we also know so well from countries like Sweden. And of course here the focus is very much on the benefits that these systems, these socio-ecological systems provide to uh, society. Uh, and these are some of the, the books that have described that pretty well. So actually the Routledge, uh, the Routledge Handbook on Urban Forestry is really a good kind of state of art summary of where we are today in, in the field of urban forestry, which is about uh, 50 years old now as a, as a field of its own, an interdisciplinary field of its own. And of course, over time, um, people like myself, but also people like Thomas Randrup, uh, some of you will know, and others have tried to kind of capture what is then so special about urban forestry. Well, it's integrative, right? So it tries to really connect these different types of vegetation, which have often been the domain of different professions. So maybe the horticulturalist or the arborist were doing one thing, the park managers, the landscape architects were doing one thing, the planners were doing one thing, the ecologists were doing one thing, and then of course the foresters were doing another thing as well. Uh, we also try to connect across urban and peri-urban. So it's not only about the urban area per se, but it's also about linking up with the peri-urban landscape. It's strategic. So in that sense, actually, it brings in a, a forestry perspective in many ways. So we try to think long term about the resource base, about developing, about tree growth, about ecosystem development, multiple use. It's clearly uh, multidisciplinary, but, but actually, I would say it's interdisciplinary as well. So it really 
is shaping itself as an interdisciplinary field these days. So we take contributions from many fields and disciplines and try to, to move the field forward. It's focused very much on citizens, on, on the users of the urban forest. So it's, it's really as typically a kind of participatory focus. And this seems obvious, right? But it's, it's urban. So for, for, for example, for foresters, this has meant a different kind of demand set. Um, there are different growing conditions. There are a lot of people that, are, uh, that have an opinion about urban forests, for example. And we need to meet urban demands in this very high, complex, very rapidly changing settings, setting called cities. So just some images to kind of show what the urban forest is. Well, I think this is a really great picture. This is Vancouver, the place where I lived until uh, summer 2020. Um, this is taken towards the downtown area and you see the city is basically a forest. And you see this kind of rich, diverse um, resources it's actually combined here, a park uh, over park and street trees. But you really get the idea that the, the city and the forest really go into a symbiosis. And of course, when you get to the downtown Vancouver area, it's less the case because there the buildings are dominating. But also there you will see, uh, will see um, tree species. And then when you go to the, um, to the North Shore Mountains in Vancouver, you come to wilder forest areas where there are bears and, and, uh, and pumas, and mountain lions, and where we actually have uh, water protection forests as well. So you see kind of in a nice picture here what the urban forest is, is all about. And it starts with a single tree, like this wonderful uh, plane tree, platanus tree in Amsterdam, which really shapes the space all by itself, right? It's really phenomenal what a tree can do to, to space, to experience. Um, but of course, tree trees, this is again is in Vancouver, this is Norway maple, uh, not very popular among ecologists in, um, in Canadian cities, of course, because it's an invasive species or at least a non-native, but, but giving a lot of shade uh, in, in cities that are actually getting hotter like Vancouver. Uh, and then, of course, the cultural element and parks, like uh, here, Park Guay in, in, um, in Barcelona, designed by Gaudí. Um, and here you see this really nice uh, combination of art, art that is adapted to nature, inspired by nature. Um, so some of the urban forests can also be highly designed, like in the case of parks and, and gardens. And then sometimes we try to imitate nature. This is the Otomachi Tower project in Tokyo, uh, a project which is four or five years old, where the Japanese actually try to imitate a natural forest environment. And they grew a little forest outside of Tokyo and then cut it up in smaller pieces and reestablished it here in this very urban site. Um, it's a small area, but, but it really gives you a bit of a feeling of being in, in a forest uh, with the wildlife that comes with it. Uh, a tremendous amount of bird species has already been found here. And then this is kind of the image that many of us have of the forest. Um, and this is also urban forestry. This is the city forest of Sonsbeek in Arnhem. Uh, and I show you my good friend here, Jeroen Glissenaar, who, who, uh, who is an urban forester, but he, he still um, decides that he wants to dress up as a real, as he says, as a real forester. So he dresses up in green. Um, he, uh, he has a big beard. So he has kind of this classic image of a, of a traditional forester in a way. But he says for him, it's kind of a communication means. He wants to show that, hey, actually, you can have forest in the city. Um, and then, of course, on the other end, I can show you pictures of urban foresters that look very much like business people uh, and that are much more kind of into the political side of things as well. So, so not only do we talk about urban forests, but we also talk about urban foresters that can be extremely diverse. Yeah, so the complexity of, of urban forests. So uh, we'll talk about trees and forests. We talk about the, the bridging between public and private, um, benefits and fears, biocultural diversity, wild versus controlled, and then also governance and management. So I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the, the tension fields that we can see in defining urban forest. So of course, one is that we look at uh, individual trees. We look at, uh, at street trees like this, and then we come, that comes of course, and some of you on the call or on the Zoom are, are experts in this, right? Try to understand, okay, how do we establish a tree, a street tree, for example, in these really difficult conditions? Uh, limited growing space, limited soil volume, a lot of infrastructure. So this is kind of one side of the spectrum. Uh, and then this is the other side of the spectrum, right? You're in a, in a forest area here, the Costarola Park in, in Barcelona, which is much more based on, um, on silvicultural aspects and, and maybe using some more conventional forest methods, but also adapting, of course, to a, to a different range of, um, of needs and demands. And then there's some interesting crossovers. Uh, some of you may have heard about the Miyawaki method, which is kind of a tiny forest approach. So you try to imitate very dense uh, forest planting in, in very small plots that could be less than uh, one hectare, for example, to, to create some benefits on, on the short term and also to kind of get some kind of ecological processes uh, going. 
Then there's a tension between the public and the private, obviously. So um, one example that, that I came across that I think is really interesting is in the city of Selje in Slovenia. Uh, this is my good friend, Robert Hosnik, uh, who has to manage uh, many, many private forest owners who are jointly managing the city forest of Selje. And of course, he then, as a representative of the, of the state forest service, he has to find some kind of way of bringing all these owners together to to cater for the needs of the citizens. And they created this brand of, the, of Mesnigost, the city forest, and they, they give support to the forest owners and have some incentive schemes to, uh, to make sure that actually the forests are used for public interests. Um, and of course, sometimes it's extremely top down, right? This is Beijing in China, where they're doing uh, this huge afforestation campaign. They planted 50 million, five zero million new trees, they're doing another 50 million. The scale is just incredible. Um, but they're actually, when they do it, what they do is that for public interest, for stormwater regulation, for recreation, they actually push away people living in some areas in Beijing, uh, what they call illegal settlers, people who don't have the right uh, authority to live in Beijing, but they have built houses and they live in pretty well developed areas. And then these areas are knocked down basically to create green space, which of course, uh, for many of us is a bit of a weird feeling that all of a sudden green is actually taking over from, from social and from, uh, housing needs. So, so there are some interesting tensions here between the public and the private uh, and between the different interests as well. This is just a little monument in that park, in that forest park. So it actually talks about the, the settlement that was there just a few years ago. And as we know, things go very, very quick in China when, uh, when forests are being created, parks are being created. Then, of course, it's also tension between benefits and fears. Um, there's, there's a lot of evidence these days, and many of you will know, about what trees and forests can do for us in cities, uh, things like health, things like climate adaptation. Um, you see FAO here, but it's, uh, it's infographics. We did the one on the right. Um, this is a really nice piece of work done by a colleague in Canada called uh, Carly Seater, who uh, actually looked at canopy cover in neighborhoods and, and found that if you come to a 40% canopy cover, there's a dramatic increase in the cooling effect of trees on local neighborhoods. And she and her colleagues, they were biking around Montreal, basically, trying to see what the effects were um, on hot days, but also on cooler days. So, so the research we have on the benefits of, of urban forests is getting better and better, um, especially in, when it comes to things like climate change, adaptation, cooling, stormwater regulation, but actually also public health. There's quite a lot of research now. But then we should not forget that not everybody loves trees, right? So there's also... Uh, there's, there are these fears. Um, people have images of trees. Uh, they have fears for trees falling on them. Um, there could be diseases. There could be um, just in general, maybe sometimes irrational fears as well for trees. And the famous NIMBY, of course, not in my backyard, right? We love trees, but not exactly here in my backyard because I get the leaves, I get the, the flowers, I get the branches falling in my gutter, etc. So there, yeah, there are some of these issues. And of course, with urbanizing society, when people get more remote from let's say being in a condition where they know nature, they're, they're exposed to nature, they know what, what natural processes are. There is of course a, a tension here that people feel that trees can be a little bit, a little bit scary and dangerous. And then there's biocultural diversity. So um, of course we talk a lot about biodiversity. We talk a lot about cultural diversity, but we often lack to integrate these two. And when we talk about urban forest, this is really a product of biocultural creation. So I just show you here the picture of the Sagrada Familia here in Barcelona, uh, Gaudi's uh, masterpiece, lunacy, whatever we want to call it. But, but he was, of course, extremely heavily influenced by nature, uh, the Catalan landscape, etc. So, so the pillar, that hall of, of, the, of the forest is reflected inside the Sagrada. And of course, that kind of translates then into the connection of, of Barcelona, uh, people living here with trees that is, uh, that is also pretty strong. So we shape uh, biocultural diversity in the forest, we shape urban forests, we experience them, we live them, and sometimes also we remove them. Um, so, so all these things, of course, are very much human driven. So the urban forest is really, it's a, it's a construct between nature and people. There's no doubt about that. Um, some of you may also know this case, which is for me also an ultimate case of, of kind of, on the one hand, conflict, but also biocultural diversity. The so-called jungle, which was a, an urban for is an urban forest close to Calais in France, just where the ca the, the, the the canal tunnel uh, enters, right, enters or goes under the sea. So a lot of immigrants have um, have or illegal immigrants actually have uh, found their place in this forest, trying to find an opportunity to get to the UK uh, from France, and they created their own society in this forest, 
uh, which became the jungle. Um, but of course, then there became a conflict also with people living in Calais wanting to use this forest for recreation purposes. So the police went in and, uh, and cleared out the forest, which of course led to a lot of uh, imagery. So there's a little YouTube video there uh, about it. There's even a movie about it called Jungle, which could be interesting for you to see, just to show how complex these relations can actually uh, get. Also kind of the, the newcomers, right? The newcomers who claim an urban forest versus the people who were there before, uh, insiders, outsiders, and then how these roles can shift over time. And that also then brings me to this, this contradiction between, or this tension, as you're saying, between wild and controlled. So you see here actually the, um, the one of the big parks in Seoul in Korea. This was created for the soccer World Cup, the football World Cup, uh, on an old garbage bin, but it has become this kind of wild uh, forest park now. Um, but on the other end, of course, we have this really high-tech highly controlled urban forest elements like Singapore gardens by the bay or like the vertical forests uh, in Milan. And now actually people talking about bringing a vertical forest to, to Mars when we get there one day. So it's a real big spectrum between letting nature go and letting it do its work to controlling nature almost to the extreme and shaping it and using it in our buildings. Uh, but then as I said, you have these really wild areas like here in Mumbai where there's the Sanjay Gandhi National Park where there are still um, um, leopards and there are many stories, I spoke with an expert from there, of, of uh, especially animals, uh, domestic animals being taken by leopards, but actually also children being attacked by leopards that come from the forest into the surrounding urban area. So, so talk about wild. Huh? And, and in Vancouver, it was, uh, we had the incidental issues with, with bears that came from the mountains. And these days, there's a lot of issues with coyotes that are attacking joggers in Stanley Park. So, so there are, of course, some elements to wildness. Um, while well, on the other end, of course, we want to experience uh, wild nature. We want to be inspired by it. And we want our children to be able to, uh, to play in nature. Um, and these kind of ideas are kind of nicely brought together in, in for concepts like the Forest City program in China, uh, where people like Kong Yang Yu, a famous landscape architect, try to use nature, but then really give it a strong cultural flavor as well, and use nature to deal with uh, issues like, for example, climate change, like flooding, like creating uh, more livable cities. And this is what happens down in China today. So parks that were more traditional, like the typical lawn, a little bit of trees, a lot of uh, flower beds, they're changed uh, very fast into this kind of forest-like parks. Uh, this is a small park close to uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, where we did a project with students from Beijing Forestry University. Uh, and here there are, I think, 55 tree species, multiple layers. Trees are planted very large, typically in China. Uh, but then you also see on the picture here in the bottom, right, there's already some issues here with, with health of the trees, etc. So the question here is then, okay, if you want this kind of forest experience, how do you work with, with culture? How do you work with society that's there? How do you work with nature? Um, and also the users, because before in this park, there were many uh, groups of old men that came there with their, their birds in cages. They would sit around and would hear the birds sing and they would chat with each other. But there's no space anymore in the in this new nature park for them. So they are on the periphery of the park and are being pushed away from it. So yeah, one's pers one person's gain can be the other person's loss as well in urban forestry. And then finally, of course, there's a lot of complexity in, in the governance and management uh, side of things. Uh, this is just, again, Beijing, uh, which is pretty top down, of course, how urban forestry is done. But just look here. Uh, these are all the kind of public authorities that are involved in urban forestry, in urban afforestation in Beijing. Uh, and of course, also have their own agendas, are sometimes conflicting. This is really nice work done by a PhD student called uh, Na Yao, uh, Beijing Forestry University. And then there are issues like farmers who actually have to provide the land for the new forest. There's no uh, objecting, all right? So it has to be done. Uh, and then all of a sudden they find themselves as forest managers, urban forest managers. And they come with their agricultural mindset. So they start clearing everything underneath the trees. So you go to an urban forest in Beijing, you will typically see just trees, no undergrowth, because the farmers think we have to have it clear here. It has to be um, without risk for fires, without risk for pests. So there are some interesting challenges there in terms of education. And then I think really fascinating is that, that from urban forestry, basically you see these new approaches, new concepts emerging as well. Many of you, of you know about nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, uh, and of course also this whole idea of national park cities or urban national parks, starting in, in Stockholm, of course, but now becoming a big thing. Um, London has declared itself a national park city in its entirety. So it says the whole city is a national park. 
Uh, and Canada, the Canadian um, um, Forest Service recently actually declared that uh, all Canadian cities should really strive to have an urban national urban park within their boundaries. And the first one is in Toronto, the Rouge National Park. So yeah, coming to the end here of my, my brief introduction, um, I think one of the things that we'll see a lot in urban forestry is try to, to make these things, these, these complex governance and management situations understandable for people. Uh, and the city of Toronto has done some really nice work there. You see it here on the left, right, trying to, to, to visualize this is what we want with our urban forest. We want to increase the canopy cover. Uh, we want to be better in serving you. We want to make sure that we plant more native species. And I've done a little bit of work in that with, with my 33300 rule to try to see, okay, we know all the evidence about what trees can do for us, for our health, for cooling. Can we give some guideline of how cities can work with that? So it turns out if you can see trees, you can see green space from your window, you're in better mental health. Uh, you, you perform better, you concentrate better. If you have a canopy cover of 30%, ideally even more, right? But then you see tremendous cooling effects and you see also, again, improvements in people's mental health and well-being. And finally, we know also from the World Health Organization, if you don't live more than 300 meters away from the nearest public green space, again, you're much more active, you're physically active, you're healthier, and also your mental health improves. Um, and it was a little bit of a gimmick when I did the 330, 300 thing, but it has been picked up all over the world and cities are now implementing it um, to the extent almost that I start thinking, okay, now it's almost getting too much, right? But let's see where this is going. Um, and it, it raises a discussion about what, what urban forests are uh, whom they should serve, right, and, and what kind of benefits they, uh, they provide. So I think these will also be questions to be picked up a little bit later in the discussion, but, but the question, of course, is from your specific background, uh, from your disciplinary focus, from your experience, how do you, you see that complex urban forest? Like, what is your entry point here? Um, and also, how can urban forestry be relevant in a time when there's a lot of focus on, on greening cities, on making cities more sustainable, uh, resilient, but there's also a lot of different uh, fields going into this and a lot of different concepts like nature-based solutions, resilience, ecosystem-based adaptation, green infrastructure. So how does urban forestry here fit in with its specific focus as well? So yeah, just some discussion questions. This was a bit of a rat race through some of the ideas and concepts, but a complex topic, all trees and associated vegetations, uh, an urban woodland history in Europe, and also a lot of tension lines that actually are I think creating a lot of fascinating developments, research and practice these days. Thank you for listening.